as I read it, was that it put the responsibility in the officer's uh, hands that whenever he wanted to use the voucher, uh, it was at his discretion. He could, within two hours of the start of the shift, he could present a voucher uh, for hours work. Okay. Okay. So we'll come back to Mr. Stanton now. What is this the side letter, by the way, in Exhibit 6? Oh, I'm sorry, yes. If you see Exhibit 6 is the SF first <coughs> agreement, and Exhibit 7 is the, um, the voucher report as part of what they turned in their vouchers for. So with, with the results that you see from the SCI tours, and the, the payment of overtime not worked, not ended uh, in the attempt that you were, the goal that you were looking for, what is it that we're actually proposing? Well, like you said earlier, we thought that the forest agreement was going to fix this problem. And even with what we thought was the right solution, we still had to pay out over $10,000 in un 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 unworked hours. So what we propose is eliminate the language, eliminate the equalization requirement. The management would put the local association on notice 24 hours in advance of the need of an overtime and say, let them know how many uh, shifts we need or how many uh, slots we need to fill on a specific shift. And they would have 16 hours to notify us who is going to work those shifts. And any thing, if they do not identify somebody to work the overtime, we would fill it with the mandate. And any overtime needs that arise within that 24 hour period, we would fill up the mandate. Now, just briefly explain to the panel. Oh, no, go ahead. go ahead. Explain that there's no change to the mandatory language and how that mandate works briefly for the panel. Yeah, the mandation uh, is it's not equalized, it just works in uh, reverse seniority order. So that would continue. There's language in there about uh, last minute call offs, and, and there is a penalty already, a penalty payment built into the language for improper mandates. That would, that would remain the same. This would just, quite, quite frankly, when we have a need for overtime, we just need a qualified employee to fill, fill the slot. And under your proposal, because you don't care how the association fills them, because my thought is I mean, I've seen enough overtime equalization programs, and sometimes you'll have a shop store that are working for me that's in the bargaining unit handle the overtime, but then he makes mistakes too, and, and you know, an employee grieves that, you just can't say, oh well, that was one of your own members that did it, so we have no responsibility. But, but if I understand your proposal right, you're saying you're doing it any way you want. Do it however you like. So there, at least arguably, there could be no mistakes. Correct. And, and there'd be no criteria to equalize the overtime. Correct. There would be no, no requirement to equalize the overtime. Well, actually, that, that sounds like something that would be kind of interesting because if you put um, that up as a bargain in a bid job, then it would be the union's fault. It would be that particular person's fault. Well, but it depends on what the process is by which over time to sign. If you allow me to clarify one yeah. point in response to that, Mr. Stanton, when we say we're going to turn this over to the union, we're not talking about paying a union employee to do it on work time. No. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't even have to clarify that. <laughs> I, well, I just didn't want Mr. Welby to be misunderstood when he started talking about bid jobs. Your Clearly, goal, that bid job would not have been made contact. Your goal is not to pay people not to work. Correct. We cannot continue to pay people for not hours not worked. There, there's overtime available. We recognize that. We need the people to work for that overtime. That's all we have. Is that a question, Tom? Sure. <clears throat> Mr. Stanton, um, I'm attorney Todd Egan, attorney for PSCOA. I'm going to ask you some questions. If you don't understand, just ask me to clarify. I'd be happy to do so. You made the statement that, yeah, well, let me just ask you this, because I think I need to clarify. I, I think I understand the issue, but the time period that we're talking about is, is a six-month period, correct? Correct. So from January 1st through the end of June, and then the beginning of July through the end of December, those are the, that's the equalization period we're talking about, correct? Yes. Of any particular year? Yes. Now, uh, you say, and the statement was this, in regard to the eight-hour standard, you said it was virtually impossible to meet that standard. Do you remember that testimony? Yes. Now, it's not impossible, though, you would agree. <clears throat> During the 
Mahanoy Award, part of the testimony from the executive deputy secretary, the executive vice president at the time, Ed McConnell, he testified that prior to this case in 2007, 26 facilities had been able to equalize within eight hours twice a year, and nobody had not done it within eight hours. I have looked at the numbers. I have not found one in that period that got it within eight hours. Okay. And I've had several people come to me and say, this eight hours would be just impossible. Nobody can do it. So what you're saying, because I don't see it in the records here, you're saying, I'm looking at the grievances that were filed. Mm -hmm. According to what you just said, we should see, for all 27 SCIs, for both time periods, the first six months of the year period, the second six months of the year period, a grievance on every one of them for every facility. And that's not true, is it? No, not, those grievances have not been filed at every institution. No. So when you say it's virtually impossible, Correct me if I'm wrong. It's not impossible, though. I've never seen anybody do it. Okay. Well, we'll find that out, I think, through your next witness, because I think it's been done. And I think you just don't want to recognize that it's been done. When, when it, 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 has there been instances when a specific lieutenant has been assigned the task to equalize, and it's been done? To your knowledge. I've never seen an end of equalization report that has within eight hours. That's all I have. For Mr. Stanton, but. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, keep going. Oh, are you done with Mr. Stanton? Yes. You want me to follow up now? No, I'd rather we do all of them. Okay. Lieutenant. Wait, 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 Todd, question. Sure. Lieutenant, um, you put into evidence slide number five. And that's the equalization for exhibit number five, the equalization for Dallas. Uh, and that's from January of 2010 through June of 2010, correct? I don't have a copy of it. Okay. Here. And that's the, and you testified in front of all our interior to true about this particular equalization time period. Do you recall that? Yes. Okay. Um, and that's what the grievance that we were up in, uh, in Dallas about. Yes. Okay. Now, since June 31st of 2010, Lieutenant Long has been assigned the task at SCI Dallas to equalize overtime, correct? Yes. And in the second part of 2010, July 1st, 2010, through December 31st, 2010, Lieutenant Long was able to equalize overtime within eight hours, correct? I don't believe so. I believe there was a grievance filed on that. At, at the second part of 2010? I believe so. Okay. Well, I would disagree, and I would submit that you should review your testimony from the previous arbitration when you agreed with me. Now, I, with I, that I'm being sorry, said. I, objection. I don't believe his testimony, because I was present at that hearing, said that it was equalized. And in fact, after that hearing, my understanding is the local of Dallas withdrew an overtime equalization period for the period that you're actually referencing. Right. Well, so they filed it, 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 So it, I guess we can well, clarify the record ask, by, first of by all, seeking well, first of all, I'm asking questions, on, questions of the witness. Hold on, you hold on, I'm talking. The, the record is back in my office, so I'll check. <laughs> all right, that's the grievance I'm saying. The grievance was filed so, and it so was withdrawn. I can, I can check that. All right. So you don't recall the local president for PSCOA testifying that it was equalized in the second part by Lieutenant Long? No. Okay. So you stick to your testimony. You said it's, it is not realistic. You used the term realistic. It's not realistic to, uh, to equalize within eight hours. No, I don't believe so. Okay. Now, what about the beginning of this year, January 1st through the current? We're now towards the end of May. We're five months into it. Now, you've been able to equalize so far this year, haven't you? I haven't called overtime in the last four days, so I don't know how close they are right now. All right. Is Lieutenant Long still responsible for doing in the most of the equalization? Most of it, yes. Okay. He works uh, eight to four and does most of it. Okay. So, and just assume that what I'm telling you is correct. If, if Lieutenant Long has been able to equalize in the second part of 2010 and the first part of 2011, then 
would you reconsider your testimony that it's not realistic to equalize overtime? No, just because he's done it for two periods, I've seen it not be done for the last 14 years. Okay. Now, Deputy, let me ask you this. You were involved, were you involved in the negotiation of the local agreement? I was not. No. Okay. And are you aware that there was admission by the Commonwealth during that local agreement that the fact that it wasn't being equalized at SCI 4? Objection. He just said he wasn't a part of the agreement. Let me ask you, if you know. If you know. Let me ask the question. Let me ask the question. You'll have time to try to re-buttress their testimony. Now, would you admit that the reason that overtime is not equalized at SCI 4 is because the lieutenants that have been assigned it have messed it up? I have no knowledge of that. I'm aware of the local agreement is why it's not equalized per contract. That's all I know. You've been at Forest since the beginning of 2010, correct? No, since the beginning of this year. Oh, since the beginning of 2011. Okay. So when the local agreement was put into place in 2010, you were involved in it as you previously testified? No. Okay. Do you know why the parties met to do the local agreement? I do not know the history behind it. Okay. In your experience, no. Strike that. That's all I have for today. Okay. Anything from the panel for any of the three witnesses? No. Brian, do you want to resurrect? Yeah, just to clarify, Mr. Stanton, the concept of what, there's 27 institutions across the state? Yeah. Do all 27 institutions follow the pure contract language with regard to overtime equalization? No. Several of them have local agreements and they've developed their own procedure. So those facilities that have local agreements, would you be surprised to find that they don't file overtime equalization grievances? No. Why? They just don't. I don't know that they're within eight hours, but they still don't. I believe they think that it's been equalized, even though it's not within eight hours. Okay. That's all I have. Brian, good-hearted people. So the institutions that have local agreements where you're not seeing grievances from? We still see grievances from them. I can't say that all of them have filed equalization grievances. Oh, okay. Of those local agreements, have you seen any that you think work? I think Forrest was the closest that worked the best. All right. Free for us, thank you. Nothing. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. That's all for today. All right. We're going to adjourn for today. We are going to reconvene for the last day tomorrow morning, and we're going to start at 9 o'clock rather than 9.30. Thank you. Thanks.